All right, welcome to the Monty Collier Report. If you'd like to get a published copy of the Monty Collier Report, then just send me an email, and I'll send one right out to you. In this sixth segment of the Monty Collier Report, we're going to continue our examination of the free offer of the gospel, which is the second part of the first point of common grace. It was the Christian Reformed churches which formulated these three points of common grace, and they did this in 1924. Uh, Louis Burkhoff is probably the best known theologian that was part of this group which formulated the Three Points of Common Grace. And Cornelius Van Til and John Murray are probably the best known uh, Orthodox Presbyterian ministers who adhered to this a little bit afterwards. Now that we've made some preliminary statements on the free offer of the Gospel, let me just go ahead and continue the demonstration of how the free offer of the gospel is logically incompatible with the Bible and Calvinism. Now, if you will remember from our last segment, the essential thesis of the free offer of the gospel is that God desires the salvation of the reprobate when he hears the preaching of the gospel, or you might say that God purposes the salvation of the reprobate when the reprobate comes under the preaching of the gospel. This is the essential thesis of the free offer of the gospel. Now it is the classic, undisputed position of Calvinism that our God is omnipotent, and whatever an omnipotent God desires or purposes must come to pass. God cannot separate His power, His omnipotence, from His will, because God is a simple being. Therefore, with this in mind, those who adhere to the free offer of the gospel must demonstrate that an omnipotent God can desire and purpose some things which do not actually come to pass. If those adhering to the free offer of the gospel can demonstrate this, then they may have a chance of demonstrating that the Bible teaches the free offer of the gospel. So we're going to now look in the Bible to determine whether or not God can purpose or desire something to happen and it not come to pass. Let's see what the Bible says. Turning to the book of Job, we read, But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. Book of Job, chapter 23, verse 13. Now when the Bible here says that God is in one mind, it is asserting that God has one will, and that this will cannot be turned or affected by the finite creature. We see this when it says, Who can turn him? So we see that God has one simple will, and it is immutable. It cannot be affected by finite creatures. And then it says, What his soul desireth, even that he doeth. This right here demonstrates that God's immutable, simple will is logically connected to his omnipotence. Whatever he desires, he gets it. This flies right in the face with the free offer of the gospel, which teaches that God can desire some things and they not come to pass. According to Job right here, whatever God desires, he gets. This is the first attack on the free offer of the gospel that I have never seen anybody who adheres to the free offer of the gospel give any type of logical, systematic answer. And it needs to be answered if they're going to adhere to this. In relation to Job 23.13, we must also note that those who teach the free offer of the gospel maintain that God desires the salvation of the reprobate who hears the preaching of the gospel, and he simultaneously desires their damnation as well. This presents God's mind in a conflict. And this is completely contrary to what we just read here in Job, where Job teaches that God is of one mind. His mind is not conflicted. He is not struggling amongst himself. He knows what he wants to do according to Job here, and he's going to do it. The book of Job teaches that God's mind is not in conflict. He knows what he wants, and whatever he purposes, he gets it. John Calvin vigorously opposed the idea that God's will was not one. Calvin wrote, and I quote, But on the contrary, I have faithfully expounded, amongst other things, how the will of God is simple and one. End quote. See his book, Secret Providence, 743. It follows that Calvin would reject the free offer teaching, which implies that God has opposing wills. Let's just take a moment and examine a syllogism, 
which teaches this basic Calvinist principle found here in the book of Job, chapter 23, verse 13. The first premise, all things that God desires are things which God effectually brings to pass. Book of Job 23.13 Second premise, the damnation of the reprobate is a thing that God desires to come to pass. This is the proper Calvinist teaching. The conclusion necessarily follows. Therefore, the damnation of the reprobate is something which God effectually brings to pass. The basic syllogism demonstrates that God's desire to damn the reprobate will effectually come to pass. Now let's just take another look at a syllogism which demonstrates the necessary logical outcome of the free offer of the gospel when it is combined with this premise from Job 23.13. The first premise will read, All things that God desires are things which God effectually brings to pass. From Job 23.13. The second premise states, The salvation of those reprobates who hear the gospel preached is a thing which God desires to come to pass. Therefore, the conclusion necessarily follows, and that conclusion is this. Therefore, the salvation of those reprobates who hear the gospel preached is something which God effectually brings to pass. The force of this argument cannot be denied. If God does desire the salvation of those who hear the gospel, and an omnipotent God always accomplishes his desires, then we cannot avoid the logical conclusion, which is that those who hear the gospel preached, elect or reprobate, will be saved. This is a form of universalism. It is contrary to what the Bible teaches. The Bible never teaches that every person who hears the gospel proclaimed will be saved by God. And thus it again contradicts the teachings of the scripture and cannot be accepted as Calvinist doctrine. You see that whenever we discuss God's purposes and God's desires, we are discussing the absolute predestination of God. And when we're talking about predestination, we're talking about God's purpose, what God purposes to come to pass. And I think Gordon Clark made a wonderful statement in his book on predestination when he said, and I quote, Predestination has to do with what God intends or purposes. What he does not purpose cannot come to pass. Predestination, chapter 2, page 41. Now some teachers of the free offer of the gospel will object at this point, and they will say that, well, God can purpose the salvation of these reprobates who hear the gospel, but God doesn't have to act on his omnipotence. They're asserting that God can somehow disconnect his omnipotence from his purposes and his desires. And this teaching, by those who uh, take this line of thought, who adhere to the free offer of the gospel, is completely contradicted by John Calvin in his commentary on the book of Isaiah. And we need to go ahead and read this, or hear it, so that we can understand just how contrary the free offer of the gospel is to Calvinism. Listen to this quote from John Calvin. Calvin says, and I quote, We ought to contrast the two things which Isaiah recommends to our notice, namely, the purpose and the power of God. We ought to believe, first, that God is true, for he declares nothing that is not fixed and unchangeable, and, secondly, that he is powerful, and that nothing can withstand his arm. For his hand ought never to be separated from his mouth. We must not imagine his power to be... As philosophers talk, a power that is unemployed, but as the scriptures teach us, powerful and active. This is from his commentary on the book of Isaiah. Calvin was commentating on chapter 14 of the book of Isaiah, verses 26 through 27. You can read the citation for yourself in volume 7 of his commentaries. Notice that Calvin says clearly that those people who believe that God's will is somehow separated from his omnipotence, that his power is somehow separated from his desire or purpose. Calvin says that those people who believe that God's omnipotence is somehow unemployed uh, in relation to his purposes, these people, according to Calvin, are completely contradicting the express teaching of the Bible.